welcome to the farm. We're taking a short detour from corporate law this week to revisit two important constitutional provisions, the ordinance and contempt of court. Is the Food Security Ordinance a constitutional impropriety? And 11 months since the Supreme Court order, Sahara has yet to pay up. We revisit the history of contempt in India. Our top story this week is a departure from core coverage, but it's an issue that deserves deliberation. Four years ago, in its 2009 election manifesto, the Congress party promised a Food Security Act along the lines of Employment Guarantee or Nariga. When it came to power later that year, the President of India, in her address to Parliament, announced that a National Food Security Act will be enacted. Two and a half years later, the National Food Security Bill was introduced in the Lok Sabha. The next month, it was referred to the Standing Committee and one year later, the committee presented its draft report. Subsequently, the government made an attempt or several attempts to discuss the bill, but a non-functioning parliament put paid to those efforts. So this month, the President of India promulgated the National Food Security Ordinance. Now, Article 123 of the Indian Constitution says, if at any time, except when both houses of parliament are in session, the President is satisfied that circumstances exist which render it necessary for him to take immediate action, he may promulgate such ordinances as the circumstances appear to him to require. What circumstances then would warrant that a law as socially and financially important as food security be passed hurriedly via an ordinance by a party that has been in power for nine years now? Does this amount to a constitutional impropriety? To answer that, I am joined by two veteran and renowned senior Supreme Court lawyers lawyers, Anil Divan and Arvind Datar. Mr. Divan, Mr. Datar, thank you very much for your valuable time. I'm going to focus on the wording of Article 123 and the first thing I want to question is what defines the circumstances that warrant immediate action. I suppose then this debate is not about what because we'd all agree that food security is a constitutional right but it's about when. When do these circumstances warrant an immediate action, an immediate action such as an ordinance? Mr. Devan, what is your view on the timing of this move? Well, I am speaking as a lawyer because there are so many issues on this food security ordinance. First, there is criticism which may be right or may be wrong about do we have storage? Second, do we have the money? Third, will it be effective or will it lead to a lot of uh, maldistribution in terms of black money? Fourth, apart from anything else, would the states agree because states have to implement? Now, these are questions of policy. These are not questions of law. That's right, Mr. Divan, and we'll focus simply on the process, not on the specific aspects of what the bill intends to do. The process is what I'm questioning here. Does the Constitution or does Supreme Court jurisprudence define the circumstances that are required or necessitated before an ordinance is passed? That's the question I'd like to put to you and subsequently to Mr. Datar as well. Right. The article says the president has to be satisfied. Not you, neither me, nor the court. The president has to be satisfied. That's number one. Secondly, he must be satisfied as to the existence of circumstances which make it necessary for him to do so. And if, suppose he goes wrong, what is the remedy? The remedy is that within six weeks of parliament reconvening, they will either adopt or throw out the ordinance. So that's the normal remedy prescribed by the constitution. Now how do the courts come in? The courts have in the past said if it's a fraud on the power, a fraud on the constitution, then they will intervene. And the leading case is Vajwa's case, where what happened was the Bihar government went on promulgating ordinance after ordinance after ordinance after ordinance without bringing the ordinance provisions before the legislature, the legislative assembly. And this the court says, this is not what the constitution requires. You must go to the legislature, get it validated or invalidated or whatever it is within six weeks. So that's the major case, fraud on the constitution. Apart from that, it's a subjective satisfaction of the president, very difficult to be challenged in a court of law. 
Uh, Mr. Zatar, clearly uh, the circumstances surrounding the National Food Security Ordinance are nowhere close to the Wadwa case as pointed out by Mr. Diwan. Uh, I understand that this has to focus on the satisfaction of the President. But the satisfaction of the President, I understand, is open to judicial review, isn't it? So it can be that the courts can question uh, under what circumstances the President was satisfied. And that brings back the question of both timing and motive in this. Yes, as far as this particular ordinance is concerned, I think it is uh, wholly inappropriate and improper for them to have introduced this ordinance at this point of time. As you pointed out, the article says that the president should be satisfied that he must take immediate action. Now, those are the two crucial words, immediate action. So, if he does not take action immediately, there could be some calamitous consequences on the country and therefore you can't wait till the uh, legislature assembles and passes the bill. Now, of all the bills pending, what was the need to pass the food security ordinance? For example, uh, a few months ago, they passed the criminal law ordinance after the Delhi gang rape case. One can understand, yes, there was some emergency to have laws to check acid attacks and so on. But certainly in the case of food security, there was nothing in place. And if you read all the clauses of these section, uh, 52 sections of the uh, food ordinance, it can't be implemented immediately. There's so much of groundwork to be done. So this is really, I'm sorry to say, it looks more a political issue rather than a issue which was contemplated by Article 123. And as far as your question is concerned, the courts can question it. Unfortunately, the law is not very clear. Uh, you see, uh, this has not happened for the first time. In the bank nationalization case, Mrs. Gandhi passed the ordinance just two days before the parliament convened. But by the time the case came to court, the Supreme Court said, now the act is there, so we'll leave the question open. Now, one thing I must tell you that in the emergency, the first bill which was uh, amendment made by Indira Gandhi was to make sure that the satisfaction of the president was final and conclusive and no court could question it. So this was the amendment she made and after the Janata Party came to power, they deleted this clause. Therefore, in one Supreme Court judgment, they say that, look, the satisfaction of the president is not final conclusive. It can be questioned. Suppose, it, like Mr. Devan says, like in the Bihar case, it is misused again and again, then you can do so. But later judgments have said that the uh, satisfaction of the president cannot be questioned. So the law is not very clear on this particular subject. It is perhaps a good reason why the matter should be taken up and decided at the earliest. Uh, Mr. Datar, uh, there is a you know, PIL that has been filed, but that is nothing to say whether yes. this will be in fact looked at by the Supreme Court uh, uh, in, in urgency. Yes. Yes. Uh, I, can I borrow yes. from some of the jurisprudence I came across when it came to Article 356, mm -hmm. which also dealt with the President's satisfaction? Yes. And in, that, in, yes. in those cases, it is made quite clear that the President's satisfaction is judicially reviewable. But I couldn't find, like you pointed yes. out, anything similar when it came to ordinances. Uh, well, there is no case. Actually, in the A.K. Roy case, when they introduced the National Security Ordinance in 1980, uh, Justice Chandrachur has observed that this question has to be considered at some point of time, but they left it open. But later in a case from Andhra Pradesh, where they challenged the Governor's Ordinance, the Supreme Court said that the satisfaction of the Governor and President cannot be questioned. So, there are two conflicting judgments of five judges, and I personally feel that if it has to be resolved, then it must, it will have to go to a bench of seven judges as to whether the satisfaction of the President can be subject to judicial review. That's the law on the subject. You see, there are two things which we must bear in mind as lawyers. When you say president's satisfaction, the president normally acts because of the advice of the cabinet. That's one. That's our jurisprudence. President has no independent power. He has to act according to the advice of the council of ministers. Now, the president's satisfaction here in this case is a legislative act. There are other acts which are executive acts. Now, when you have judicial review, there is no question that the Supreme Court or the courts would have the power of judicial review. The question is, would the power of judicial review be exercised in a particular case? And are those circumstances there? Now, suppose it's a completely perverse satisfaction which almost tantamounts to a fraud on the constitution. Then alone, in a, such a very rare case, the court would intervene. Otherwise, normally, this is a political process, whether it's immediate or not immediately required, is a matter of a political decision by the political uh, wing of the government. So, suppose a PIL is taken out tomorrow. The first question is, will it be heard within six weeks of the... <laughs> Parliament coming into session. 
the first thing the court will say, look here, Parliament, you have got an option. Parliament can either adopt or Parliament can throw it out. And the time factor will be such that suppose you have a session in August and in six weeks it will go before Parliament. So the question is, how is the satisfaction to be regarded as perverse or a fraud on the Constitution? Otherwise, by and large, the courts will not interfere with Article 123 satisfaction. Mr. Datar, would you agree with that? Because all things given, our yes, discomfort yes. with this ordinance may exist, but the right to food is a constitutional right. And in that sense, uh, any law that provides for that cannot be seen as a fraud upon the Constitution. So then what could be the fate of an ordinance of this nature which is challenged in the Supreme Court? Uh, well, you see, the point is, uh, as you rightly put it, in terms of food security, it's a constitutional right. The court may not interfere. As Mr. Devan points out, this is going to happen again. This is the fourth or fifth time the, an ordinance is challenged and by the time the matter comes to court, it is replaced by an act. So the court leaves the question open. So this could happen well again. But the whole point is this particular bill which is lying pending from 2009 for it to be passed just now, immediate action. I think it's certainly not what was intended in Article 123. If you read the process by which this article was incorporated, in fact, in the Constituent Assembly, they were very much against this power. They said that this ordinance making power was is, 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 should not be there in a democratic constitution. But despite that, it prevailed. So it was only for extraordinary emergencies which could not wait that this power was, uh, was introduced. Many of us would share your discomfort with the timing and the motive of uh, this ordinance, yes. Mr. Datar. Yes. But is there anything that requires the President to explain uh, the motivation or explain why he thought that the circumstances existed for him to be satisfied that an ordinance was necessary? And, and just to you know, uh, sort of add to my question, I want to quote to you from the Reddy versus State of Andhra Pradesh case where the Supreme Court said that yes. while the courts can declare a statute unconstitutional, Constitutional, when it transgresses constitutional limits, they are precluded yes. from inquiring into the propriety of the exercise of the legislative power. Given this is the President's use of legislative power, do you think a court can question yeah. his assessment? Yes. See, I give you one example where we succeeded right. in stopping an ordinance. Uh, yes, in 2003, on, to be precise, on 16th October 2003, uh, they passed the National Taxation Tribunal Ordinance. Now, this was passed just overnight on 16th October. There was no reason why they should suddenly pass this ordinance. It had devastating effect. It meant that overnight, all the high courts could not decide tax cases and they would be shifted to a national tax tribunal. Now, at that time, it was widely rumored that this was done just to help certain bureaucrats who are retiring on the 30th, 31st of October. So, we moved the Madras High Court overnight and the Madras High Court was able to effectively stop that ordinance Later it became an act and we got the act stayed. It is still pending in the Supreme Court. So there are cases where we could show to the court that this was a clearly a fraud, as Mr. Devan puts it, an abuse of power and there was no reason to put this ordinance into place. I mean, you can't just overnight take away the High Court's power by an ordinance without any discussion, nothing. So there is a precedent where the High Court has interfered, but there is no Supreme Court decision on, on a similar ground. The facts of this case are very different from what you've just spoken about. Hence, the, the, yes. the question I want to ask as we bring this conversation to a close is, do you believe the facts of this case, especially when it comes to mm. the process in which this food security ordinance was passed, given that it was an electoral promise from five years ago, do you think it will survive a challenge or there will be cause enough for the Supreme Court to delve into the circumstances, the timing and the precedent satisfaction? Uh, well, in this case, I don't think the challenge will survive because it is not so grave as a kind of a fraud on the constitution. It is constitutionally improper but it may not be illegal in that sense. So the courts may not uh, entertain the challenge is my view. Uh, the, uh, the other particular reason is the government can always turn around and say that look because of the opposition paralyzing parliament again and again and what is the guarantee that the monsoon session will not be paralyzed and therefore we had to bring in the ordinance. I entirely agree with uh, Data that it would be very difficult to persuade any court to strike down the ordinance on the grounds available. Just one thing, I, I thought the least the President could have done is at least to send the thing back and ask the Cabinet what, is the, what are the grounds for immediate action. That would be a better exercise of his constitutional power. Uh, th that's hoping for simply signing on the dotted line. Well, I don't know how many presidents have done that in the past. Gentlemen, I suppose we have yeah. no option but to hope that Parliament does its job finally on this bill. Mr. Divan, Mr. Datar, thank you very much for joining us with your valuable views. With that, we're going to take a quick break on the firm. Up next. 11 months since the Supreme Court order, Sahara has yet to pay up. 
we revisit the history of contempt in India.